According to the Quran, certain types of food are forbidden or haram. Karian describes any animal which has died from natural causes, disease, accident, or those animals which eat dead animals. Blood includes liquid blood or food made from it. Pork is anything from the pig. Guided by this, Muslim scholars generally outlaw eating scavengers, such as dogs or crows. Pigs are explicitly ruled out by the Quran, although there were many other practical reasons for avoiding pork in hot countries, such as its tendency to turn bad very rapidly. Modern industrialized food production has created problems for Muslims, as all sorts of additives are included in manufactured foods. The danger is that these have unacceptable elements, such as pig products in them. Bread or cakes might contain lard or suet from a haram source. Sweets can contain gelatine from haram sources. Alcohol in all its forms is forbidden under Islamic law, whether it is to drink or in cooking. Even in medicines, an alcoholic base would be avoided if at all possible. On the other hand, most foods are permitted or halal. In the case of water-living creatures, most Muslim schools accept them as halal no matter how they were killed, provided that they are alive when they leave the water. For the Shia and the Hanafi schools of Islam, fish must have scales and fins to be halal. Other schools generally approve seafood as the sea is considered clean. All vegetables, plants and fruit, apart from those substances which could be classified as drugs, are halal for Muslims, with no particular rules about their preparation. Vegetarianism is permitted as long as one doesn't claim that meat-eating is wrong. In the case of animals that have to be killed, there are strict regulations governing the way that they are to be kept and slaughtered. After being reared humanely, they are to be killed as quickly and painlessly as possible. Whilst they await slaughter, they are not allowed to see or hear other animals being killed. Then thanks must be given to God for its life before the animal is killed with a single cut to the throat by a skilled person. The effect is instantly to cut off the supply of blood to the brain so that suffering is minimal. The blood must then be allowed to drain from the body. Methods of slaughter that do not allow the release of blood are not acceptable to Muslims. Killing of animals should only be when necessary for food or other practical reasons. Animals are part of God's creation. Hunting or shooting simply for sport is forbidden. When giving a food gift to Muslim friends or providing refreshments for a meeting, it is important to check that all ingredients are halal and to make available the ingredients listings from packets so that Muslim guests can check for themselves. Different Muslim cultures have different customs regarding eating. These are locally determined and are not part of Islamic practice. In some cultures, the custom is established of men and women, accompanied by the children, eating in separate places, or of women waiting whilst the men are served first. In many Muslim societies, people eat with their hands, as they do in many non-Muslim countries also. Because the left hand is traditionally employed when using the toilet, it is well established that the right hand should be used for contact with food. Muslims hold a spoon or fork in the right hand. This has a spin-off in other areas. For instance, 
it's customary to hand over money from right hand to right hand. To do so with the left could cause offence. Drawn from these sources, Islamic law came to recognise five categories of actions. These are those categories that are obligatory for every Muslim, individually, or fard ein, for the community, but which can be performed by a group on behalf of the whole, or fard kifaya. Those recommended acts that carry a reward if performed, but do not involve punishment if omitted, or sunnah. Neutral acts, which carry neither punishment nor reward, as people are free to choose, or mubah. Actions that are disapproved of, but attract no specific punishment, or makru. Any action that is clearly forbidden and carries a punishment if it is committed is classified as haram. Let's see how these classifications work out in practice. First, fard ein. That is something obligatory for every Muslim. For example, the regular rhythm of prayer and fasting during the month of Ramadan. Then, fard kifaya, those actions that a group can perform on behalf of everyone, such as looking for the new moon, or taking part in funeral prayers. Examples of recommended or sunnah actions would be exchanging the greeting, salam alaikum, performing additional rakah, before or after obligatory prayers, and visiting the sick. Things that are neutral or mubah would include styles of dress, types of diet, or tastes in literature. Smoking would be disapproved or makru, and drinking alcohol haram or forbidden. Naturally, there are some variations of opinion regarding the three middle categories. Also, as time goes on and knowledge advances, some actions may well be reclassified. For example, some would classify smoking as forbidden, as it is now known seriously to damage health. We are all the stewards of the good things of the earth. Everything belongs to God and we are really only the custodians of what we appear to own. Therefore it follows that we should use the goods of the earth for the benefit of all humankind, and not for our own selfish ends. This is covered by the Islamic term sadaqah, which we can translate as bearing one another's burdens. This is a humanitarian principle. There is no room for racial or any other kind of discrimination. All human beings are members of one family, and therefore the suffering of anyone in need is a concern for the rest of us. There is no limit set to the concept of charity in Islam, provided only that we discharge our family responsibilities first. In accordance with this, all forms of economic exploitation are forbidden. There is a tradition that says the labourer must be paid his wages before the sweat dries on his brow. One form of such exploitation is riba. The term riba is often translated as usury or the giving and taking of interest. Muslims are encouraged to lend money to those who need it, if they can do so, and they should receive it back in full, without making anything on the deal. Capital must not be advantaged over human effort. In an interest-based system, 
the borrower is liable to repay a loan plus interest, whether the business succeeds or fails. The lender cannot lose. Rather than taking a bank loan secured against assets, Islamic finance requires an injection of capital to be in the form of an equity stake in the business. In this way, the capital is put at risk, and that risk is shared proportionally by both the lender and borrower. If the business prospers, the lender gets back their capital plus the increase in the equity. If things go badly, the lender must take a proportionate share of the loss. In a society based around lending and borrowing at interest, it's very difficult to live according to Islamic economic principles. Bank accounts, credit cards, saving schemes are all likely to be based on interest and thus be forbidden or haram. In a society based on home ownership, there are real difficulties as to whether taking a simple repayment mortgage can be permitted as the only available means of housing one's family. Muslims are naturally required to make provision for the future. Pensions, savings, health and education funds. Such monies must be invested on a shared risk basis, rather than in an interest-based system. Equity plans have been developed for Muslims to save for the future, and many banks are trying to develop products based on Islamic financial principles. There is a principle in Islam that if something is haram for me to do, it is haram for me to profit by others doing it. So, for example, alcohol is forbidden for me to drink. That means I am forbidden to trade in alcohol or to invest my pension fund in alcohol-related businesses. This has given rise to ethical screening of investment plans according to Islamic principles, a practice shared by many other ethically conscious investors. There is no sin in being wealthy in Islam, provided that the money has been made in permitted or halal ways and invested in halal funds. However, those who have wealth surplus to the current and future needs of their family are encouraged to remember that they are only custodians of the good things of the earth. Such surplus wealth should be given to those who need it, so that they can become economically active, support their families, and in turn contribute to the whole of society. The Islamic principle of infaq. Making space for Islamic financial ethics is an ongoing concern in many contemporary countries which are run on interest-bearing principles. In societies run according to Islamic ethics, the social welfare needs of people would be provided for by Islamic institutions, such as a charitable trust or waqf, as happened in various pre-colonial Muslim communities. Islam affects every aspect of human life. And therefore, the way a Muslim earns his money and spends it and even saves it is important, is significant. And therefore, pious Muslims are always concerned as to where their money is coming from, how they are earning it, where they are keeping their money, where that money that they are keeping, what it is doing, what the banks are doing with it, and also how they spend the money. And therefore, uh, in the West especially now, there is an urgent need for Muslims to rediscover some of these theological teachings because they are concerned about a whole system which is based on something that Muslims will describe as problematic, especially with regard to interest. And therefore, they are always now debating 
the possibility of establishing Islamic banks. Uh, these days there are a couple around in London, in Birmingham and other places. And also uh, ethical uh, savings or ethical investment. I mean, this, of course, I have to accept that these days it's not just Muslims, but non-Muslims are also finding that there are problems with the general financial system and therefore they are finding ways of making ethical investment and earning ethically based money.